Uh, we have any room for public comment. I will give my public comment precursor, but do we have anyone online who might be interested in public comment that is wanting to listen to that? Otherwise, we can skip it. Yes, we do. Um, so if anyone online wants to give public comment, uh, please do. Uh, I'm assuming we have sound for it. Uh, we're having some sound issues. Uh, again, public comment is is an opportunity for the public to provide comment to an, either an agenda item or some other relevant topic. Um, the board is in listen only mode, but public comment does uh, prove very helpful to the board. Uh, we oftentimes do follow up and and ensure that action is being taken to address any issues that are raised. Uh, and it also informs um, our feelings about what the community it wants and and is is needing and, and definitely helps shape uh, our agenda and our actions. So um, if we're silent, it doesn't mean we're not listening or responsive. Um, so with that, anyone online uh, want to do public comment, please use the raise hand function. And if you don't know how to do that, just go ahead and take yourself off camera and, and wave. Looks like no public comment. Um, consent agenda. Uh, do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? And we have a lot of great things in the consent agenda. Uh, including the um, did the no, yeah did it make it in there okay, oh, okay. well I, oh, it was in blue my eyes were not focusing on it okay um, do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda do you have a second any discussion I have a comment yeah I just want to appreciate the negotiations work that was done and and appreciate that a contract is signed and that's you know I, th I think we I I hope that the teachers in the IA group feel well compensated I feel confident about the contract and I uh I hope that our teachers and staff do too great thanks right now I I feel very good about the contract as well um and uh you know hopefully we uh particularly on the compensation front, um, did something to address both the fact that, uh, you know, teachers are very valuable members of our community and obviously our school system and that it's been a rough few years and that inflation has definitely, I think, hit everyone hard. So I appreciate that as well. And I want to express um, my gratitude to the uh, Facilities and Energy Committee for the Net Zero Resolution. I think it came out in a really good place and I know there's a lot of good good hard work and good thought put into it. So thank you. Um, any other comments? Yeah, to add to that, just <clears throat> a public thanks to Tim Favorite from Montpelier Energy Advisory Committee. Um, his, he's just been invaluable and ever at our disposal for questions, dumb and otherwise, and it's just, um, just been an incredible resource and really generous with his time. So thank you, Tim, if you can hear us out there. Yeah. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> um, and second, I would just like to appreciate Beth Kellogg, who is RVS's departing principal, um, who in my experience has done a wonderful job in pulling our community back into the school after the pandemic. Um, and in my experience has just been a very high integrity individual who welcomes the kids off the bus almost every single morning, unless it's frigid and terrible, which excuse for that. So I just really want to thank Beth and wish her the best of luck in her uh, new endeavors in Portland, going back home. So thank you, Beth. Great, thanks. Emma? Um, I'd just like to add thanks for the net zero resolution as well. Um, you know, it was over a year ago now when the Montpelier High School Earth Group came to us with a presentation. Over two years? Oh my gosh. Okay. But the Montpelier High School um, Earth Walk students, um, sorry, I said Earth Walk, Earth Group students came to us and did a presentation and asked for us to uh, pass a net zero resolution. And really, I um, give a lot of credit to Kristen for making sure that that moved forward. So when she came on board and was part of the facilities and energy committee, she really um, was the impetus for our committee moving that forward to the board. So thank you, Kristen, for all your work. You. And when the resolution was drafted, we had a lot of different readers. So Tim was a, a huge help.
And then we also, um, you know, it took a village to, to write that resolution. So I appreciate and want to extend thanks to everybody who helped um, revise that. To be specific, Samantha Lash also from Central Vermont um, planning was also incredibly helpful. Lots of thoughtful, good, hard questions. Um, and also Andrew, <laughs> who came to a lot of meetings and made a lot of space and time in his schedule um, to be there every step of the way. So mm -hmm. thank you. Excellent. Um, any other comments? Otherwise, you can vote. Oh. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. Great. And yeah, I just want to echo that we did. Uh, the consent agenda is usually pretty boring, but there are three, <laughs> three major things in there that are um, the product of a significant amount of work, and uh, I think really great steps forward for our district. Um, Andrew. Um, track discussion regarding bids and I have some updates for us. Yes. So uh so we got our bids for the track project last Tuesday. Um unfortunately they were over budget. They were higher than than uh what was we were hoping for. Uh we have in consultation with our engineers and our soils consultants as well as uh, some conversations that um, the engineer had with the lowest bidder, um, we think we've got a, a way forward. Uh, fundamentally, not this year though, the gap, so the, we were hoping for around about, about 1.7 million. It came in about 500,000 higher than that. Um, and the strategy we had for reducing costs, which we, we all have nod our heads that yes, we can, in the process of construction, we would have been able to knock out a lot of that. We weren't going to be able to confidently know we were gonna knock, knock all of that out of there. So given the schedule and some of the processes that would have to take place with regards to soil testing and consultation with Casella Waste and revisions to permits and all that, we just felt it was, we we'd recommend that we hold rebid the project next winter and take in sort of these factors that we've discussed over the last week or two last week or so um of some options and some tweaks and some changes that we do so um yes there's there's many factors i want to go back and sort them out a little bit more before i share those you know get to i don't want to make promises i can't hold up to so that's where we are with the track project. I was just wondering, do you have any thoughts or explanation on like, is it inflation? Is it materials? It's is a it little bit of everything. Um, there is, there was, we were one of the last projects to be bid in the season. So that was, that was huge. Uh, we had um, some of the soils costs are higher than much higher than we had seen in previous projects and higher than the engineers had expected. Um, in general terms, like some things that that cost us X amount when we did the UES playground, which was, you know, it was five years ago, but now those costs are four times that amount, you know, and and um, so. And there's been also some changes and I think there's new soil fees or disposal that's been added on the, that, that is relatively new. So there's, there's a bunch of that stuff. Um, and just, yeah, inflation is, is this huge. Inflation is this huge. Thank you. Um, and being the last project, I think that has a lot right. to do with it. Okay. Everybody is just, I sit in the, the state, the uh, agency of education has a, they have their bi-weekly, uh, Construction, construction meetings. meetings, and then they have bi and and just people are just struggling to just get bidders. Mm -hmm. Forget the cost; it's just getting bidders is, is a real struggle right now. And that should tell you the amount of work that the AOE now has a biweekly meeting with school districts around construction yeah. and construction alone. And it makes me a little nervous because I'm thinking, are we on top of things, or are we behind the eight ball? But I have a feeling that there's a lot of there's a lot of schools that still aren't even, you know, haven't even got their heads around this stuff yet, but. They're doing a good job. They've been very helpful. So, and so, do you think waiting a year is 
what what I think it's what, one of those rare opportunities in construction that actually waiting is not going to hurt you inflation wise. Okay. It's, Do you think it will actually reduce costs? To, to yeah. Build anything than right now. Um, so I actually think that prices probably will come down okay. in the next and will be the first product, not the last product. Okay. So, so that should get a lot more interest, give people a little more confidence that they can get things lined up and get the equipment and get the drainage tiles and all that stuff and know that they can put the ground running. Yeah. So this will be the winter of 2023? Yeah. Yes. Well, fall, late fall. Of that's a, it's an interesting question. That's another thing we have to talk with our contractors. So it used to be you put your con you put things out to bid right after Christmas, right after the new year. People were back, hunting season was over, the holidays were over, and you could, but um you know if we I think that if we put this project out last fall, they would have come back and said, We have no idea what the what asphalt's gonna cost six months from now. So they may have been a little bit of increase there. So those are the kind of questions that we need to, to talk, but um we need to talk to our con we need to talk to our engineers and, and circle back with some contractors on get their sense of where we're going, when the best time is. And the least expensive bid was 500 k over what over the hopeful target of around 1.7. Yeah. Was there a large delta between the most expensive bid or were there all? No, actually, it was about a, it's about hundred thousand dollars, hundred thirty thousand dollars. So that their bids were, were pretty tight considering that it was up in 2.2, 2.3. So that's a good sign. I know there was a lot of community interest and passion for this project that the board heard. So I'm just curious, like in what form, like is, is there going to be like kind of redesign that has to go rethinking of the. It will be, it will be a, um, it will be a finer, I think with, because we knew we were, we were pushing this through in the, in the, in the winter, it was going to be a quick design. So we're going to look at some other fundamentally, the project is not going to change. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a good quality running track. Mm -hmm. Um, some of the things like the lacrosse seg safety netting, well, that can we do without that? You know, mm -hmm. We use the temporary ones that we've got, so maybe there's a little money there. Some of the more more refinement of where we put storm water, you know, programmatically where we've got it is great, mm -hmm. but there may be a less expensive option. But maybe programmatically where it sits isn't as great, but it saves us lots of money. So. Um, we haven't gotten to that level yet, but I think, mm -hmm. and some refinement of just sort of soil quantities and things like that. Mm -hmm. So I know you were really proactive last round, like you pulled kind of a stakeholder group together to get input on design as you kind of kicked off the project. Is that something, will you like re-engage that group or how do you see? I don't think it's really necessary because okay. again, we're going to keep the, the, the stuff that we would change would mm -hmm. be nothing anyone would notice. Mm -hmm. You know, they wouldn't know that we, Change from a schedule of 50 pipe to a schedule of 40. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or then, mm -hmm. you know, we change a sub base from one thing to another. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that's really necessary. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of the amenities that we have, we would just continue to have as add on mm -hmm. You know, we would, I'm not going to have the engineers take the safety netting out of their drawings. We just mm -hmm. call it alternate, add alternate one. Mm -hmm. and, and get the savings that way, see what the savings are that way. Mm -hmm. So okay. no fundamental change. You know, we're not, we're not going to propose changing the size of the track or anything uh -huh. like that. Uh -huh. It's going to be the same project and a lot of the changes are just going to be stuff that engineering changes. Yep. Okay. And refinements. And... Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Emma? Uh, just for our track athletes that might be listening or watch later or want to know, when can they? When can students expect to be running on a new track? Now that we're pushing it. Uh, well, that again, that doesn't schedule is another big piece of it. We have this proposed as a two-year project. We're going to look to see can we make it a one-year project? We can make that. That's a huge. That's a huge savings. Um, and even with the going forward this year, it was going to be two years before the the surface was on anyway. So that may not change. That that date may not change. It, it may get pushed out of here, but um, one of the options we're looking at is how do we condense the construction schedule and get it into one summer, which would put it on track with what we proposed with this project. 
And so that would be like track season 2025. Correct. Yeah. Which is what, again, even if we were sitting here saying we're on budget, we're breaking down, that's probably that's when we would it would be available anyway. Mm -hmm. So it may be a push. So thanks. Um, Joe? I was just wondering as a as a board. The, financially, we can just continue to leave this money um, committed, right? Yes. This doesn't change yeah. that. We don't have any sort of penalty for not using it in this fiscal year or something like that, right? No. Okay. Great. Thank you. Other questions? No. Well, thanks for that. Um, it all makes sense, and hopefully, and at some point in the in the relatively near future, we will we'll have a plan laid out that, yeah. that we can understand. But I just want to give people a little, a little bit of time to, to think. No, yeah, excellent. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Andrew. Oh, I have, well, we're on board discussion. I have one more just piece of, uh, I think I want to run by the board, which I did not put in the agenda at the beginning. Uh, we have a few exit interviews we want to do at the next meeting. Um, I think when you discussed on how to do them, there was a little debate whether this is something where either like me or a couple people do the exit interview and then report back or whether we have it with the whole board. I'm happy either way. And I think the people doing the exit interviews, which is, our, which is Merrick and Zach, who are exiting as board members, and then um, Beth, who's exiting as the RVS principal, I think both would be happy to do them with the whole board if I have to go into executive session. So I just wanted to get a sense of the board as to how you want to, to do those. I'm happy either way. I think I think Merrick and Zach want to do it a little earlier. So we might have to start early and go into executive session, but we could just change the warning to do that. Um, and then Beth also wants to do it in person. So I'm, I'm happy. I actually think it might be more effective. If the whole board is there so they can hear and ask questions, but, um, but I just wanted to get a sense because Mia seemed, Mia especially seemed to remember that we had talked about just having one or two members do it. And I have to admit, I don't recall. I think as a board, we'd be better but I'd also defer to the exity or exeter. Yeah. I think all of them are, are, are happy to do all board. So, okay. so. I think it'd be great if we could all do that. Right, perfect. Because it that's, would help us work with the new people coming in too. Right. Excellent. That that's where I lean. But. And so we're gonna embed embed it into the meeting as an executive session. Yes. Okay. I think we'll do American. Well, I, they want to start at like five forty five. So maybe if we could. Um, we could we could maybe push them back to six if that works better for people or see if they can come in later. Um, I had just scheduled it for 545 thinking that we were going to do it outside of a meeting. Yeah. So it was more considered like tacking it on before one of the meetings or after one of the meetings. I think you might want to start earlier just thinking of the agendas that are coming up. Those would yeah. make for very long meetings. We did it during a meeting. Yeah. Are people okay starting at five forty-five or six? And then we could we could do it virtually too. Uh, Just send out a note. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, it will be worn on the agenda. As yeah, such. and and we can send out a reminder as well. Um, yeah. And no, Jim, I I, I emailed you about the policies going on the agenda. Yes. Okay. So that will be next meeting, also. Yes. The first policy reads. Let me make sure I, I will make sure you <laughs> Sir, with the exit interviews the 31st, is that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we've got three meetings this month. Okay, okay perfect. We will start early and, and do both of those. Hopefully they won't take more than 10 or 20 minutes, but I think it'd be great to get feedback from all of those folks. Um, All right, so I think we're on to our learning focus. Yes. So um, Mia actually recommended this for um, a training opportunity, this webinar. 
Um, so if board members, we're not going to project it. If you're not on the Zoom, get yourself on the Zoom so you can see it on your computer. Um, and we will test out the audio as well. So if we can get this to work, it might be a little shaky at first. Um, but this is a webinar that Mia attended um, back in January. I watched it the other day. It's an excellent webinar. Uh, the purpose is to, to talk about um, the board's role in closing the opportunity gap. So I think it's it will set the board up really nicely for your retreat come this summer. Um, there's a couple spots that I have planned um, just to stop and say, hey, thoughts on that? The webinar is about an hour long. So um, I just want you to keep that in mind with conversation. So if I cut it off, then that's why, just to keep the conversation going. Okay. All right. Let's see if we can get the... No, it's not working at all. And that is currently Trisha's title for the uh, Washington School Directors yeah. Association. Thank you. Uh, so we have a lot of history together and, and a lot of good work together. It's exciting to see Trisha's leadership in this area, both of how school boards affect student outcomes and especially in educational equity. Uh, also a longtime friend, Ivan Lawrence and Dr. Wellington. Uh, was a school board member for 20 years. I think we might have to do this through my computer. You know, Sadie, what do you think? Um, when you're sharing it, you have to click share on it. Can you do that? When I just click the share screen? When you're sharing it to Zoom, you have to share on it. Where would I do that from? Um, I think it's once you click share, then it'll be like an option and then you have to check off the box long to look at it. Yeah. I promise I'm not that technologically stupid, but <laughs> I think you have to stop sharing. Are you screen Yeah. Stop sharing. <laughs> ah, okay. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, let me try this again. Mm -hmm. Sir Pamela would be very happy. Two ago, I started. After serving a number of years on local school boards in Northwest Montana and decided to uh, pursue the dissertation on school boards. We don't need to see anything. Yeah, hold on, hold on. This is very layered. <laughs> I feel like there it is. All right. The dissertation and it's grown and grown and grown. And so we're finding more and more uh, things out in student achievement. Wonderful. Thank you for that. So we're going to just dive right in today. Um, I'll tell you just briefly a little bit about um, our association, um, the Washington School Directors Association. Oops, I went too far. Um, uh, has uh, uh, is based in Washington. Obviously, we um, in you you may hear Ivan and I occasionally call school board members school directors. Um, they are called both of those titles in Washington State. So um, to prevent you from being confused if we uh, use those terms interchangeably, I wanted to let you know that. Um, that's what we call them in Washington State as well. We have um, about we have two hundred. Ninety-five school districts in the state of Washington. You can see them um, on your screen. They're um, of various sizes, scattered all across the state. Um, you probably think of the picture down in the lower left-hand side when you think of Washington. Um, perhaps Seattle, um, Mount Rainier, um, perhaps the mountains that you see um, over on the bottom right-hand side. But we also have um, a good half of the state in the eastern side that is much more rural, um, more agricultural and drier. 
And um, as with many states, the two sides of the state are significantly different. And sometimes those um, differences are wonderful differences, and sometimes they are some cause for um, for a bit of polarization. And I suspect that may not be new to any of you who've been um, school board members for any period of time. So I'm gonna start with this really uh, inflammatory <laughs> statement right here. Good school board governance is boring. And I tell you that with 18 years of experience as a school board member myself, and um, almost 10 years of experience in working with school boards. Um, I can tell you when I come home um, at the end of a board meeting <clears throat> and my husband asks how the meeting was and I say it was fine, it was boring, that's a good thing. <laughs> Probably some of you can relate to that. Um, because good school board governance creates the conditions for students and staff to be successful. And it has positive impacts. Um, you can see these board members here are working together, looking at each other, listening thoughtfully, at least they look like they're listening thoughtfully. Those may not be their thoughts on the inside. But we've seen a lot of this this year. <clears throat> you have parents yelling at school boards. You have school board members yelling at each other. And what um, Dr. Lawrenson is going to share with you over the course of this webinar today is that ultimately that does more than just cause for a lot of chaos at the board and the parental and um, the staff level for your school district, it actually has an impact on your students. If the adults are not focusing on the things that are important for them to focus on um, for uh, students in the district, ultimately it's the students in the district whose outcomes you'll be impacting. So we'll share some uh, a lot of data with you um, based on Dr. Lawrenson's research over the last number of years that um, both uh, Phil and I have had the a wonderful opportunity to work with and think about and apply to our work. This is a, was an interesting uh, uh, piece of, um, uh, it's actually a survey, a poll that was given, and this was just uh, published on uh, the 31st, so a couple of days ago, by Education Week. And um, I put a lot of the words here on the screen for you, but what I want to really point out to you is that um, the findings of the poll, which included uh, more than 1,500 voters, including about um, 500, almost 600 parents, um, looked at what their priorities were as parents. And two-thirds of voters and parents said that the kinds of culture wars that are going on right now within public education distract schools from their core mission of educating students. And instead, most of those parents and voters would really like the districts to agree on all of the things that most of us are focusing on during our hopefully boring board meetings, which is providing that safe and welcome environment for children, ensuring that all students, regardless of their background, have the opportunity to succeed and really have a strong foundation um, to be able to do um, what is needed to be done for them to get their educations. So again, I thought this was really interesting, a very recent research that was just published. So I'm going to turn it over to, uh, to, to you now for a bit, Ivan. Sure. I'll see if I can keep my uh, internet going here as we, as we move along. Um, sc public school education and, and the influence of boards. Um, it, it's usually the case that it's not difficult to know when something is going wrong, uh, whether it's your car that's malfunctioning or whether it's a, it's a medical condition, you, you've got a sense of something is going wrong. But it's really hard to figure out what exactly is going wrong uh, and how to fix it. Uh, and that's what we're attempting to do. Whenever you have the case where you have either uh, high levels of conflict, uh, low levels of student achievement, disagreement within the board. We've got a sense that something is going wrong. One of the fundamental mindsets that we're finding is necessary. Oftentimes, um, school districts have this Christmas tree shaped organizational structure uh, with maybe the board or community at the top 
uh, with the superintendent, and then it, it flares out into the principals and the teachers and the various departments. And we're thinking that that needs to be reconsidered, and perhaps an organizational structure such as this, where schools function in separate, separate uh, entities, but they have overlapping formal roles. And in this case, in the next slide, we're going to spend most of our time, I think, during the next few minutes talking about this particular piece of that organizational structure where board governance has a large responsibility with the community, as well as a pretty large responsibility directly with the superintendent, and much more indirectly with the various other organizational uh, systems within the school. So um, one of the uh, pieces that's going to be important for you to um, understand as uh, Dr. Lawrenson starts talking about his research and what it's based on is that in Washington, um, we measure board um, effectiveness through the, the Washington School Board standards. And a lot of these will align with um, many of Vermont's um, governance standards. Um, I had the chance to take a look at those, and I know many of them <clears throat> focus on the board adopting a vision and measurable goals, <clears throat> adopting and reviewing operating protocols. So a lot of these will be familiar to you. I'll run through these briefly for you, and then we'll talk about how they're being used. <clears throat> so the first one is responsible school district governance. Second is communication of and commitment to high expectations for student learning creating conditions district-wide for student and staff success, holding the district accountable for student learning, and engagement of the community in education. Now, these are the five um, overarching principles. Each of these principles um, uh, uh, this, at the standard level has benchmarks underneath each of them. And then underneath those benchmarks are what we call indicators. And the indicators are actually in question form, which makes them very helpful for boards to think about whether or not their own board is applying these uh, principles in the manner that, um, that they want to be applying them. We use those indicators at, within our board self-assessment survey. <clears throat> and this really is designed to measure a board's application of the standards. You have an example here of, um, of standard one. This would be benchmark A. So the question really for the board, will, multiple questions will fall under helping them figure out, do we as a board provide responsible school district governance in these various ways. So um, this is a result from a board that, as you can see, has taken the survey for more than uh, for at least six years at this point. Um, they took it in uh, 2012 all the way through 2018. And this is the kind of report that they get back. You can see the questions are answered in, yes, we always do that as a board. Most of the time we do that as a board, down, down to no, we never do that, or I don't know. I don't know whether we do that. I don't know if we uh, focus on those things. And they get this back in the form of a report and um, that provides them with some really great self-assessment information for them to have a conversation between the board and the superintendent as that leadership team to evaluate what are we doing well? How do we double down on that? Um, where are some areas where we didn't rate ourselves very highly? And are those areas that are important to us? And if they are, what are some goals that we want to set around that? So the research question um, re, uh, that uh, Dr. Lawrenson will uh, dive into here is when we compare those board self-assessment results to state academic assessment outcomes, recognizing that those have some of their own limitations, is there a limb, is there a relationship between board actions um, and student success? And again, those are measured by what boards say about their own um, performance and comparing them to um, academic assessment outcomes. Also within um, Washington State's board standards, we have a number of individual school director standards because as we opened with, 
people yelling at each other. Um, those uh, certainly can be uh, a board behavior, but sometimes it's just one or two people yelling at each other. And so the actions of individuals really matter too, because boards are a collection of individuals either working together or not working together. Sometimes there's a lot of conflict. Sometimes there's healthy uh, conflict where people work through conflict together. And um, so these um, actions of the individuals uh, are make up the school director standards. These are um, newly updated this year, as are the rest of Washington State standards. Um, we've up, done a full update on those since they were developed uh, back in 2008 and 2009. Um, in fact, under the leadership of Dr. Phil Gore. Um, but these actions are important too, uh, looking at indi an individual's values and ethical behavior, their leadership, communication, are they in, um, regularly engaging in professional development, both as an individual and as a board, accountability, and then commitment to educational equity. And so I think it was back in, in 2010, um, after conversations with WASDA and with Phil Gore in particular, uh, we decided to put this whole idea to the test. And so we're in, in a, a study between 2011 and 2013 to determine whether the numerical scores on the board self-assessment really had any correlation or any relationship to student achievement scores in those districts. And in fact, we did find a whole variety of correlations. So the, the, the quantitative um, verification of the idea that school boards do have a, a relationship with student achievement scores was firmly established statistically. And that report was published in 2013. That originally, original study was done in the state of Montana. We repeated that study in the state of Washington and again in the state of Texas and found similar, not identical, but similar relationships in all three states. So this appears to be a, a very robust connection that we've discovered. In addition, about the same time, um, Lee and Edens, um, Dr. Lee is from Mississippi. Um, uh, Dr. Edens is, was from Flagstaff, Arizona at the time, uh, did a similar study looking at low-performing boards and, and uh, low-performing student achievement scores in those districts, and in fact found these characteristics. And uh, Lee and Edens make the claim that by watching a board meeting, and they did so virtually over, over uh, hundreds of board meetings across the country, if you see these characteristics at a board meeting, they can predictably tell whether that district is high, medium, or low performing in their student achievement. So again, uh, we, we, we found a relationship at the high end. Lee and Edens found it at the low end. Uh, it's not absolutely 100%. Um, low student achievement scores, low uh, board survey scores tend to come together. That's not a guarantee of problems, but like one author said, it's like looking at the weather. A forecast of rain is not a guarantee of rain. But if you look out the window and there are gray clouds gathering and it's windy, there's a pretty good chance that something is coming. And one of the things that we're trying to be able to identify is here are the predictive factors that something is coming. Uh, and so we need to pay attention to these items on the board survey. They do in fact describe board characteristics of high functioning districts. One of the first areas that we examined um, were overall board scores and overall district student achievement scores. And this is a, this is a, a, a general set of findings for overall student achievement. And we find out that these particular items bubble to the top 
the highest achieving districts in terms of student achievement occurred in the boards with these characteristics. The boards worked effectively as a team. There were non-negotiable goals for improving student achievement. They provided the budget, the curriculum, the technology, the facilities to support learning. There was academic progress and they used those student achievement progress reports in their decision making and discussions and they communicated very well with the community. So you can see all five standards were very important in high performing districts. The next thing we looked at uh, had to do with students living in poverty. Free and reduced lunch scores uh, is oftentimes used as a measure of a district's poverty level. This is a result of a rather well-known study out of the state of Wisconsin, um, where almost all of the districts in the state of Wisconsin, what is their what are their uh, student achievement scores? And what is their level of poverty? And you can see there's a very, very clear negative correlation as poverty increases, student achievement scores decrease. And we were trying to figure out why that might be the case. This one was a little bit more difficult to unpack. Um, next slide, if you will, Tricia. And so what we what we tried to do is to is to connect this the poverty gap of that district with their board scores and those districts for example on the blue areas blue eras error arrows were high functioning boards and districts but they also had a very large poverty gap those are not the things we want to uh, promote we'd like to have where the red arrows are high functioning districts with almost no gap between the general student and the students in poverty. So we're trying to figure out what do those red arrow districts have in common? And lo and behold, we found a number of different characteristics there as well. And so, next slide. And so if you, if you see, um, these are the standards one, two, and five turned out to be the standards on top. Um, one, of course, is governance. So you've got to get your own act together. Standard two are high expectations, uh, making sure that the board articulates the idea that all students can learn, including those that are living in poverty. And standard five, communicating very well with the community about what this district's responsibilities and efforts are toward those students living in poverty. So there was a little bit of more of a focus. Uh, we then turned our, go ahead, we then turned our attention to various ethnicities. Uh, and the bottom line here, um, we looked at those districts board scores and Native American student scores. And those districts that did the best job with their Native American students, the highest student, spend a lot of time focusing on the community. They brought the community, they brought the Native community into the school district so that the students had the sense that this was our school. I belonged here. There was a, a sense of connection between the community and the students and those Native American students did very, very well. Again, standard one governance, the board has to get their own act together. And then under conditions, they have to keep the community very, very well informed. So in terms of breaking this down with ethnicity, Native American was our first focus. The second one was was on black students and very interesting only one issue bubbled to the surface those districts that did the best job educating black students focused a lot of attention on high expectations of communicating high expectations to those black students of articulating of of, of funding their stewardship and sharing with the community the rationale and plans for these high expectations for black students. So 
the power of high expectations here was very, very clear. And the third was with our Hispanic and Latinx student achievement. This one was much more diverse, much more, much broader. Um, but again, uh, the board getting their own governance team together, having high expectations for all students, budget to support all those equity issues that uh, where the lap where the Hispanic students and Latinx students need extra attention. Again, communicating with the community. Um, this this is an effort that the board does with the community. This is an effort that they don't do for the community. And finally, um, of all of the factors that have an influence on student achievement, of course, the individual student is the biggest factor. Their own abilities and skills, their home life, whether they're neglect or abuse or hungry or in poverty, or that is the biggest issue. The second biggest impact on student achievement is the teacher. So it's really important that districts make every effort to hire the best teachers they can. The school environment, that's the, that's the purview of the principal. Uh, the superintendent, we know, is also part of this. This was done in, in 2003. Hattie did this research. And so the question is, what is the percent of impact of school boards? And we really don't have an answer to that uh, mathematically, but let's take a what if. What if boards are only 2%? What if they only have a 2% role in student achievement in that district? Does that matter? Does it really make a difference? Well, if we look around the rest of the world, we can see a couple of examples of what a 2% difference is. And in terms of genetics, the chimpanzee and the human beings, there's a 2% genetic difference. So it can be huge. In terms of Professional Golfers Association, uh, this is uh, results from 2021. The number one highest paid golfer in the PGA earned almost a million and a half dollars. Uh, the lowest paid 115th rank made $14,000. That's about a four and a half percent difference. And at a two percent difference, you cut that almost in half. The difference is between the first and the second and the third place money winner is that they were two percent different every time they went out on the course. But the number of strokes at the end of the year was almost meaningless from 68 to 71. So boards don't have to make major changes in the way they do business, but if they're a little bit better every time they meet and every time they have a conversation. The, the last thing I want to emphasize here is that regardless of how you got onto the board, now that you're on the board, this is your team now. Um, it doesn't matter who voted for you, it doesn't matter who contributed to your campaign, it doesn't matter anymore who your friends are or your political or business associates are. As soon as you're elected to the board, you've changed your team and this is your team now. And these are the, the, these are the people that matter to you, these are the statistics that matter to you, these need to be holding central conversations uh, in your school board meetings in terms of decision making. Okay. Yes. Sort of, sort of, sort of. <laughs> I, know, right? <laughs> I think we just turn off the speaker. Huh? 
You want me just to go hit the button? Yeah, probably easier. <laughs> Thank that. Okay. We good now? Okay. All right. Any thoughts so far from that? There was no prompt right there. I just thought I'd give everybody a chance to respond to that piece. I'm not sure I agree with the monkey or uh, golfing analogies, but I do agree that you know everything else I thought was good. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I thought that was um, a little more. I mean, I thought the analogy was bad in general because you know the you know I mean the board obviously doesn't affect, but it affects the environment where teachers are hired, where principals are hired, where superintendents are hired. Um, you know, so all of those other things are sort of the wash through effect. And then I also it was unclear from the data. You know the, the kind of the correlation between well functioning boards and student achievement, and poorly functioning boards and poor student achievement. How much is that just a reflection of the communities? Uh, you know, I mean, communities that are probably more affluent, more educated, might be more likely to have both higher achieving students and a higher achieving board, just given the demographics. And was that? I mean, is, is that a reflection of? You know, obviously, you know board function helps but how much is that a reflection of the communities where both of those entities exist i think you have to look at remember the slide with the red arrows and the yeah and the blue arrows because that's they took out the red arrows where there was a low opportunity gap measured or low achievement gap yeah. measured yet still high board functioning like all of those all of those boards had rated themselves high yeah so that's what they're trying to measure for yeah, that's what I, that's what I thought. It was, it was yeah, it wasn't clear how much the control worked. I mean, and and the a good takeaway is, you know, especially to, um, is is the importance of community engagement and reaching out to all aspects of the community. I think came through. certainly a theme. Yeah. yeah. Any other thoughts before we start again? No, you know that's an ideal, so I'm on board with that. Yeah. The community piece. Well, the public high expectations um, resonates. You know, publicly stating high academic achievement expectations, I think, is something that hopefully we'll, in our retreats or whenever, we'll be able to figure out a way to communicate that effectively. Mm -hmm. Um, to help students see the communities as integral with the school. So you were talking about that with different ethnic groups. Yeah, I'd be happy to start off. Um, and then, um, Ivan, if you'd like to add on to that, that would be great. Um, standard three, which is creating conditions district-wide for student and staff success, tends to be the one that we notice working with boards is the hardest one for them to wrap their their um, heads around to wrap their works or their work around um so let me share with you what the benchmarks of success are in that area um, one of them is providing for the safety and security of all students and staff and in our 2023 updates which are about ready to be published we also included well-being within that so are you really keeping in mind um, the safety well-being and security of students and staff also employing and supporting um, quality diverse um, educators, teachers, administrators, um, and also providing for their um, for their professional development. So you might think as a board, we don't have anything to do with staff professional development. In fact, you have a lot to do with it because you're approving um, budgets on an annual basis that either support that or don't support that. Um, the same is true of the benchmark around providing for learning essentials. So are you as a board um, identifying and supporting budget-wise, and even in your strategic planning, um, the materials that are needed for students and staff to be able to be successful. Curriculum, technology, high-quality facilities, all of those things are included. Um, also, just ensuring management for the, for the organization. Um, 
are does the board support um, solid management um, effective use of people um, in appropriate roles and then finally all of that is wrapped up as I said with adopting and monitoring um, that that district budget the monitoring part is important too so you don't just adopt it and let it lie it's a little bit like your home budget um, you want to make sure that all along the way that you are continuing to fund the things that matter to you as a board and as a district as identified within your strategic plan I think Phil you also asked um, uh what are some examples of working with your community did I phrase that correctly I'll take a look at the question that is correct yes that is okay. correct yeah some examples of things boards are doing with the community um yeah I could, again I can start here and um would invite Dr Lawrenson to jump in um the the community needs to feel like they are part of the decision making, uh, particularly in those areas where it's most appropriate. So I'll just give you one example, and then I would uh, love for Dr. Lawrence to jump in here. Um, student voice and um, uh, parent family voice ha is certainly an area that has grown in importance and focus over the last couple of years. Um, there are you know uh, student and family um, advisory committees. Uh, getting uh, parents involved in um, understanding what schools really are doing and what they're for and including them in some of that decision making where that's appropriate um, are, are a few examples. Um, Ivan, do you have something to add to that based on the studies you've done? Uh, sure. What, what, one of the things that is often um, overlooked or a little bit misunderstood, I suppose, um, the difference between the parents and the community. Um, in fact, 70% of your voters are not parents of students currently in school. So when you talk about community, it's a much larger group than parents of students currently in school. So intentionally making moves to bring the community into the school means contacting the parent groups, it's the Chamber of Commerce, it's service organizations, it's all sort sorts of community organizations and individuals that are beyond the parent group uh, that make up the community. Phil also, uh, a couple of things, Phil also mentioned non-negotiable items that, that has come up a couple of times and been identified in, in a couple of these studies. Uh, for example, um, if a district is interested in improving reading levels, a non-negotiable non-negotiable uh, item might from the board might be within the next year or two we will experience a two percent increase in reading scores in second grade um, and it, it and you monitor that every six months or so to see if there's progress if there's not you don't blame uh, you're not harsh parent here <laughs> if you will from the board but you say, how do we get there? So you involve the staff, you involve the, the parents, and we've got a target of improving reading scores. It's non-negotiable, we will get there. Maybe we need staff training, maybe we need all kinds of facilities and extra help and tutors, but we're, our, our non-negotiable goal is to improve reading. You don't wanna set it up as a 10% raise of reading in a year and then fire every school teacher who doesn't make it. That's, that, that's irresponsible. Um, so it's got to be reasonable, it's, and, but, but the board keeps on it. Um, it's non-negotiable. We're not going to let that goal go away. Uh, whether it's two years or five years or 10 years, we will improve reading scores in this district. In terms of standard three, this is, uh, this is a tough one, this is the infrastructure of the district. Budgets, curriculum, facilities, technology, safety, all of those things, that probably eats up most of your budget. So rather than having the budget drive what you can afford, you set priorities within those major items and then try and get a hold of the budget that will make those things a reality. I'll add a little to that too. Um, yeah. 
in, in terms of the those non-negotiable goals, you know, again, um, Dr. Lawrenson mentioned that you you don't set those arbitrarily. You don't set um, yeah. inappropriate goals. This really wraps into part of your responsibility for um, evaluating your superintendent and ensuring that the communication is clear between the board and the superintendent. Everyone agrees. So setting those goals together with the superintendent and potentially the superintendent's cabinet and staff so that everyone knows where you're going, which direction and what you're aiming for. Um, everything needs to be aligned. If you have a lot of arrows going in different directions, um, then, then there isn't alignment and no one knows what they're supposed to be aiming for. But when all of those goals are aligned, the, the boards, the superintendents, staff, even the students, they all know what they're aiming for and it's um, they are reasonable expectations, then the board um, has every right uh, to consider those as non-negotiable goals and include those um, as they're having conversations with the superintendent. By the way, uh, those, those goals become non-negotiable because the board has spent the last six months visiting with the community. And in fact, Oftentimes, it's the community that says, we want our kids to read better. So the community helps the board set those goals, which become non-negotiable. And then it's the board's and superintendent's job to figure out how the district makes that thing a reality. It's, it's tough. It takes a little bit of time. Again, this is not something the board does to the district or to the community. It's something the board does with them and the right conversations with the community on one side, the staff on the other, and the superintendent. When they all come together, that becomes a non-negotiable goal that is in effect for the next two to three to four to five years. So yes. I've, we've, we've had the, the these delicious uh, red items up on the screen for a while. Do you want to <laughs> you want to dive into that? And we'll we're we're um, almost to the end. Let's wrap up, and then I see that there are a couple of additional great questions that we can yes. put, we can answer. So here. The, 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 again, kind of an analogy. You take uh, eggs and sugar and butter and flour, and you put them together, and there are endless possibilities. So a few basic ingredients plus a good plan. And you can end up with all kinds of wonderful things. Along the same line of thinking, you take a chunk of wood and, and, and put together with a plan in the right hands, you can make amazing and wonderful and creative things. So again, in the right hands, next slide, you take a few letters and a few numbers and you put them in the right hands and you have amazing letters and books and stories and information that the world benefits from. In the right hands, a few dots and a, on a bunch of lines, you put them in the right hands, you have absolutely amazing results that come out the other end. And in terms of school boards, we're finding out that those items that are identified in the board self-assessment survey, next slide, and governance expectations, conditions, accountability, community in the right hands, the board has the, the, the power to translate those things into amazing futures for the students that are under your care. Ivan, the, uh, the, the slide that shows the symphony makes me think about where we started at the beginning, which is what you do want to aspire to versus what you don't. Um, I would say we should all be aspiring towards sounding like a symphony and a little bit less like maybe a junior high band. Absolutely. That's absolutely true. <laughs> Having attended a few of those myself. Very good. Very good. <laughs> Go forward with that. So we have, um, we have a number of questions. Um, Carrie, Phil, do you want to uh, curate those for us? Certainly, Tricia. I think these are, these are some great questions and really getting at the crux of the things you're talking about. Um, what about when there's conflict or disagreement within the board, but it's subtle. It's it's not like the pictures you showed of people screaming or uh, pulling their hair out. Um, and similarly, I think with the, the community where, you know, the only time boards hear from them is when there's a complaint about something or something to do with the budget. 
Um, what, what advice do you have for boards in those situations? It's a good question. Um, I think all of us know exactly what this is referring to. There's, there's some tension that's underlying, but it's not so obvious that you're yelling at each other. You know, like it, board, board relationships are like any relationship. They are relationships between individuals and relationships between groups of people. And so there are a number of ways that you can approach um, conflicts or tension between um, people. Um, one of them is simply to um, identify it, um, you know, notice what it is, perhaps even ask the question. If you feel like you are in a relationship with another board member or a couple of board members where you can say, you know, I'd really like to talk with you more about this issue. Um, I'd like to understand your perspective on it. I'd like to share with you some of my thoughts. Could we spend some time talking about this? And this can be done, you know, one on one, um, one school board member to another, if you'd like over coffee or over lunch or, um, uh, you know, just over the phone um, or certainly within a work session. Um, I'm not completely sure how um, Vermont's um, Open Public Meetings Act aligns with uh, the same that we have in Washington, but Washington's is quite strict. So you wouldn't want to do this when you have a quorum unless you are doing so. Um, uh, you know, under the Open Public Meetings Act. The other question I think you always want to ask yourself is, is it big enough to bring it to the surface? <clears throat> so um, I, as a board member, certainly have a different perspective on many things than some of my other fellow board members. However, um, I, need to, I need to ask myself, how much does that matter? Um, if we are working towards the same goals for our students, um, we are um, interacting in a civil way with each other and moving the work along, does it matter if all of our views don't align perfectly? Probably not. Um, if we need to dive in and, and ask about them and talk about um, differences, we can do that. You can do so in a way that allows people to have different opinions um, and doesn't force them to adopt your own. But you can appreciate the differences and determine whether or not they, they are important. Ivan, what would you add there? Oh, boy. This is, a, this is a great big topic. I'm not sure how much time we've got left here, Phil. About not 15 enough. minutes, 10. Pardon me? Not enough time for the kinds of questions coming in. Okay, should we move on to the next one? I think so, because uh, this one connects back to a lot of the research and, and a lot of, I mean, not just Ivan's, but other people's research on how school boards can affect student outcomes. A lot of it um, makes the comparison with state assessment scores because that's data that's readily available. But, so what does a board do if their administrators downplay poor test scores or say things like, um, this is just a snapshot, it really doesn't correlate with graduation rates. How, how might a thoughtful board member respond to that type of situation? Well, um, underneath that question, uh, they're right. Um, this is a snapshot. And certainly a very good argument can be made that student achievement scores do not capture the full student in their experiences in education. Um, Tricia mentioned that well-being was an issue that is starting to be talked about out there. This is more of the social emotional in taking care of the whole student. I think we can foresee in the not too distant future that student achievement data will soon include this social, emotional, and well-being, uh, a much more robust and, and full definition of what it means to be a student. Um, Go ahead, Ivan. Uh, yeah, I'm having technical difficulties here. Oh, there we are. Um, at, the, at the same time, that's all we have to work with. Uh, this whole transition from just stories into here's what I think is going on into the data and the statistics which demonstrate that there is a connection between boardsmanship and student achievement. 
this is this is very vital. We've got to turn turn that back into now. How does a board change what they're doing in order to impact student achievement? And student achievement is not irrelevant. It might not be the complete picture, but it is not irrelevant. It is not something to be discounted. Um, it, it is it is uh, dangerous, hazardous to say, well, that's because of the poverty level or the ethnicity or 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 or. Um, there's no evidence anywhere to say that students in poverty are less capable or students of, of various ethnicities are less capable. Um, those arguments are um, not valid arguments in terms of a district's ability to address, to control the things they can control and help the students in the classroom with their achievement scores. I'll simply add to that, and then we can get to the next question, that this is one of those non-negotiable goals a board can set. Yeah. That is that, okay, we do understand as a board that this is a snapshot. Um, academic assessment is important. It isn't everything. So as a superintendent, what are the types of data, the, the additional types of data that you'd like to bring to us um, to help us evaluate um, how students are doing? Um, uh, student survey data, um, community data, parent data, um, input from staff. Uh, there are so many different types of um, uh, pieces of data that you can have a fuller picture of how your students are doing. There are student well-being surveys out there. Uh, so student achievement is not the full picture. There are ways to gather that full picture. So I, I'm going to ask a, a complicated question. It's got multiple parts, and then we'll get to a couple easy questions. Uh, what about a board that appears to be high functioning? Nobody's yelling at anyone. People are civil. But the board spends more time on facility costs than they ever do talking about students and student outcomes. Um, and the author of the question acknowledges there, there's an effort to close rural schools that doesn't seem to be focused on outcomes. Um, but their concerns are that their board has no measurable goals in, in spite of efforts by at least one member, and the board doesn't engage with the community. Um, how, how might an individual board member help turn that culture around? That that's a tough question. Um, how many how many uh, board members do most Vermont um, school boards have? Does it vary? <laughs> yeah, uh, somewhere between five and and twenty three, I think. Oh boy! <laughs> well, <laughs> if you're one out of twenty three, um, I'd just say good luck. <laughs> um, it's it is a real challenge, and I certainly would be happy to um, entertain uh, wisdom from either of the two of you about this. As one board member, um, you do. There are limits to um, to what you can do. Um, if you are a board that is not working with a strategic plan, um, neither your superintendent and their staff or you are working with a strategic plan. Um, that is a huge miss. And as a board member, I would say to you, push hard for that. Um, I, I would ask, you know, where where are our goals headed? What are they? And where have we identified them for ourselves, for our superintendent, for the staff, for the community? So that strategic plan is really going to be your, your um, guiding star. Also, again, looking at Vermont's governance standards, there's a lot more in those standards than just looking at facilities. And I understand facilities can be, sometimes they're the most interesting and they're the easiest to deal with. Um, and they're also very visible. But as an individual board member, um, the other thing that you could do is try to one by one quietly engage um, some of your fellow board members um, in working towards coming up with a strategic plan. Um, and as you, as you gather folks with like minds, that can be helpful. The plan, uh, um, it isn't one of the major board standards to have a strategic plan, but the reference to the district plan or the board plan is all the way through 
um, those 69 or 70 items on the board survey. So it is an integral part to a board who's governing uh, and firing on all cylinders. It really is essential that a board not only has a plan, uh, but brings it up at every board meeting and makes it the, the guiding um, principle of how this district operates. I, I would add too that you know, the, a board member in a situation like this, that they don't have any stated or measurable goals, I, I would encourage them to ask every single month, come back to a, a similar question, word it a little differently from time to time, what are our goals? What are our goals? I, and just, you know, um, I think Tricia mentioned sort of having the one-on-one -on -one conversations, and that's important that privately as well as publicly, just kind of, you know, the steady drip, <laughs> yeah, who breaks any rock? Um, so uh, people are asking some easier questions. Where do we find examples of non-negotiable goals? Uh, do you have a resource or something we could follow up at the webinar with? Here's some examples of non-negotiable goals. Yeah, good example. Uh, it's a great question. Um, I I can't point to specific um, questions that we have other than those that are in our, the board standards. So again, those indicators will all, um, and I think, um, Phil, you either have already dropped that into the that link to the chat or I can drop it in um, so that they have access to the Washington School Board standards. Yeah, we'll send that out in an email tomorrow. Okay. It seems to me too that that no district makes progress on any particular area unless there's some intentional effort to improve there. It doesn't just happen by accident. So look at a district who has passed a mill levy, who has built a new facility, who has experienced major growth in some particular, and look back at their board meetings for the last two years and you're going to find that non-negotiable goal sitting there every meeting. What are we doing on this project? How is this thing progressing? It doesn't happen by accident, um, but it takes a board member or two to, to introduce this into the conversation and just be dogged at keeping at it. And pretty soon you'll bring the board and the community along, and then you, you, you've got a a movement that cannot be denied. The term non-negotiable was really a buzzword 15 years ago, and I, I know it's sort of tripped some people up, uh, but a board member's ask, how do you make a goal non-negotiable? Like what, is there criteria that makes that, that thing non-negotiable, or is it just more emphatic about this goal? Yeah, yeah I, I think it's the emphatic about the goal, and it's always stated in a positive direction. Who, who could argue with improving reading scores? Right. Uh, who could argue with improving the, the, the access to technology? Who can argue? So if, if your goal is constructed uh, well enough, there really isn't an argument against it. And they need to retain some flexibility. Even you're, you're right, Phil. Sure. That, that is a buzzword. Um, however, things happen. Pandemics. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, all all kinds of things happen that make the goals that you've set for your team um, unreachable in some cases, or you've fallen short. And so, again, depending upon your situation, um, you know, in most cases, you probably will have had an educational team that really did its best to try to meet those goals, but perhaps for a variety of reasons, um, didn't meet them in any given year. So that is then an opportunity for you to have the conversation about why did we, why were we unable to reach these goals this year? Um, were the goals the right ones? Um, did we set uh, a, an appropriate growth level for this? Uh, what are some things that we did to try to to reach this goal and and do we need to think about some different approaches for the coming year or years sure. so are, are you aware of um, examples of community surveys or even just sort of a specific community engagement protocol that would help a board 
formulate goals that have been informed by the community? Yes, we've used a number of them in the state of Washington. Um, I know that the Youth Truth Survey is one that is a national survey, um, a very reputable um, survey company that, despite its name, Youth Truth, um, they do far more than just gather data from students, although that was their original uh, mission, was to try to understand what the experiences of students are. And that is an incredibly valuable perspective that if you as a board member are not getting, if you are not regularly hearing from students in a variety of ways what their experiences are, you are not serving your primary customers. So I really encourage that. Um, the Center for Educational Effectiveness, I know also um, does a variety of those. Many, many school districts, when they go through a strategic planning process, will have um, listening sessions where um, they have a facilitator uh, lead community members, parents, students, staff, often in separate groupings um, through a series of questions to try to gather that data. Those are just a few examples. I think, I think uh, Illinois School Boards Association has a great, well, they've done uh, half day and full day workshops at, at uh, NSBA on engaging the community. Um, so they have some great information available on how to do that. Thank you. Well, Ivan and Tricia were indebted to both All right, Bob. I'm not a fan of the term non-negotiable, especially when you have to be flexible with your non-negotiable goals. Um, I agree with the the point of the whole of non-negotiable goal setting and, and tracking. I like that because it, it to me it just goes back to accountability. Um, but yeah, just the name kind of kind of threw me off. Um, the other thing that I was sort of not totally on board with was it sounded like the non-negotiable goals were, were set pretty low, whereas I'm a fan of more aspirational goals, whether or not they're achievable. And you can measure that through smaller increments, but I still like to set goals higher, have everyone run a four minute mile, you know, we're not going to do that, but have that as the end goal, as opposed to a, a lower bar that's just easy to, to attain. It's brilliant. I mean, I, I, I agree. I mean, like, use the word non-negotiable. I, but I think they were getting at where, like, these are things we're really committed to, and, and they're kind of like unwavering commitments. Which, um, but I, agree. I think there's a sweet spot between being aspirational and being so aspirational that everyone's kind of like, we're, we're never going to get there. Um, and you know, then setting like the hurdles this high so that way you can pat yourself on the back and feel good about you know, kind of meaningless achievements. Um, yeah, I but I agree with the idea of being aspirational, but aspirational where if everything goes well, you can you can do it, and you know it's realistic enough that you you keep trying and it makes you better. Yeah, I'll remind that if we're doing, I never had heard smarty goals, but smarty goals, the A is achievable. So I think it's, you know, I would lean more towards something that we, you know, feel, I think the the delicate balance there of like a little bit of aspiration, but something that's realistic to actually achieve. Like maybe a five minute mile, which is still pretty fast. But. <laughs> you don't have my knees, man. <laughs> Any other things people are thinking about? Thinking about the community engagement piece mm -hmm. and whether or not we end up with a community engagement committee or how we approach that. And, um, you know, I think we did a lot of work with Esser. We did the work with Nathan and there were, we were kind of doing things in spurts. Um, and there was some sense that there was a little bit of weariness in the community, I would, I'm hoping that we can come up with something that's consistent, something that we can roll out 
every year. Maybe it's maybe it's two two tools every year or something that people can expect to see um, that we can increase our engagement with those tools as a goal year to year or something like that. I don't know. And I'm, I'm interested in the, the workshops and the uh, surveys and the things that they were mentioning at the end, because I think that we haven't come up with a consistent approach to that work mm -hmm. and it's, important and hard um so I'm, I'm interested in that part and then you can get longitudinal information you can sort of see how it changes over time and adjust yeah yeah and i also am really interested in the community piece and i think um you know maybe we could look at identifying the natural community leaders and encourage them to help us figure out how to gather information or the best way to present things so that we have a better beat on what the thinking is out there. I think the surveys are great tools, especially for folks who really want to maintain anonymity um, and sharing perspectives with the board. And I also feel like having that true face time, you know, I think for, for my experience, it's been showing up at places time and time again and remind like we are here, you know, the name at the end of the front porch forum, the forum post is, uh, you know, that's, that's me. I'm accessible to you. I'm here as, you know, uh, as a point person to then connect back to the board, you know, and how we kind of weave that into, uh, kind of those types of outreach like surveys, but how we get in front of people and, and very clearly make ourselves available. Um, yeah, I don't know historically what the two school districts did before we merged, um, but it feels like since we've merged, we've been making good but slow progress towards this stuff. Um, and like, you know, they, I felt like they were picking on us a little bit at a couple of times <laughs> where, you know, not, not really, but um, where they're talking about school boards that don't have a strategic plan or goals. And it's like, this is something that a drum that's been beating within this school board for a while. And so it's great that we're like getting really close to that point. Um, and so I feel good with the progress we've made. And then I also am reminded, you know, we, I think we did really good community engagement around ESSER. And I think we set in motion some things that can be um, replicated down the road with listening sessions and stuff like that. Um, and even having our student board members, Merrick and Zach, and um, you know, they were talking about having a committee of students to support them. And it made me think about like maybe having community members on each of our committees. Um, but I'm definitely in favor of the of the community engagement committee too. I feel like that piece is so important. And it doesn't squarely fall into anybody's responsibilities. Any other thoughts? I wonder, I mean, we, we, we've spoken in the past about a communications committee. Um, I wonder if that could be like a dual, you know, it could be communications and engagement. Um, yeah, that's how. Kind of wrap wrap the two up together. Yeah. I guess we get our first two committee members. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Red has a few committees of his own. <laughs> one or two. Yeah. Two one or one or like yeah. seven. Scott has his hand up. Oh. Scott. Thanks. No, he was just clapping. clapping. Nice clapping. Virtual high fiving us. <laughs> uh, all right, well, uh, this has a good, good part for the retreat. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, yeah. Some thoughts about how we can do indicators and, um, and uh, yeah, and then, you know, ideas like, you know, community engagement is one of our, our goals and, uh, a committee maybe is an indicator, but it's a it's a tool that we can it's use a strategy to, to it's reach a strategy, it. strategy mm -hmm. to reach it. All right, excellent. Well, thank you for that. That was very Call helpful. Me up. Uh, and, um, so 
policy monitoring is our last um, agenda item. Uh, and um, we have a motion to approve the two policy monitoring reports for C1, educational records, and D4, Title I comparability. Libby, can you tell us again what Title I is? I'm embarrassed that I can't. Yep, it's uh, part of the federal funding. So it's in our CF or Consolidated Federal, federal Grant Programs. Title I is um, allocated based on poverty rates. Um, and it's dedicated to supporting students who are not reaching proficiency. Okay, thank you. I move that we accept the two policy monitoring reports, policy C1 and D4. Do you have a second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Um, and motion to adjourn? Well, before motion to adjourn, uh, I just want to remind people there are assignments to give thought to uh, the retreat and which of the three things you want to be on. And um, then we'll, um, you're going to put out a, a little Google form? I already did. You did? Did you not get it, Jen? I may have gotten it. I may just have skipped over it. There are seven responses. Okay. Um, so fill that form and um, yeah, and we will we will discuss that before July. Uh, a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thanks, everyone.